never count out the resilience of dealers. Welcome everyone to the Driving Vision Podcast brought to you by the Ziegler Auto Group. And here with me, Auto Group Director of Talent Development, Mike Van Ryan. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thanks, Sam. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, like it if you do, and leave a comment. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Driving Vision Podcast and our repeated segment, which is Meet the Automotive Press. Back with me today, Auto News reporter John Hutter. John, Welcome. Thanks, Sam. Hi. So, John, it's interesting. Uh, we did an interview with you a couple of months ago, and it was highly uh, downloaded, listened to, and it showed us that your perspective is incredibly valuable in this uh, automotive marketplace. So we appreciate you coming back, and we hope maybe you'll be a uh, an often repeated guest on the show. So, so it's interesting. Let's dive into it. Often on the podcast, we talk about automotive and this industry that you and I are both a part of. You report on it. We work in it. It's a great American industry and uh, people, it's a great American industry because people can bring a desire to work and reap large benefits as a result. How do you see that in your reporting and your interactions, not only with auto groups, but with vendors and folks that support the auto industry? You hear that a lot in the industry where just you can, you know, you can come in and work hard. You don't need a PhD or something like that. You, I've heard that over and over again, you know, in kind of message boards and things like that. And, you know, and then of course the, the vendors there's always, you know, pretty much every two or three interviews, you always have a vendor remarking on, well, you know, never count out the resilience of dealers, which is more. <laughs> so that's, that's true, like, right? You know, yeah. just, that kind of speaks to the innovation. But yeah, the people that, you know, practice it like the, you often hear that where it's like you can come in and really just go as far as you want in this industry. There's really no constraints except for, you know, just talent or what you're willing to, you're willing to work hard. And that being the case, it's interesting. A topic of conversation for today is what are the biggest threats to this auto industry? As we think about things that impact us negatively and positively as being that great American industry, it's a leading economic indicator. You know, we're approaching a time where at recording on the 25th of May, Congress is about to convene or is about to uh, recess prior to the Memorial Day weekend. There's no debt ceiling deal, right? <laughs> as you're out talking to people, how much of a threat is our government's inability to put a deal together on the uh, debt package? How much could that impact auto and finance as a result? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I was at the AFSA conference, the American uh, Financial Services Association conference, which is right before the big, um, you know, NADA show. And back then, of course, that was when the first, you know, inkling that there was going to be a debt ceiling, you know, there could be a debt ceiling issue. And of course, at that point, you had like a few months to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> for everybody to figure out what they were going to do. Anyway, do. Uh, one yeah. of the one of the speakers there had an interesting point. He, he whenever the last time, and this was back in the seventies, um, and I apologize, I'm not entirely up on the history of if it, if we defaulted or what we ended up doing as a country. Yeah. But he said there's been always been a permanent interest rate, like uh, uh, the you know in the cost of funds and that sort of thing. It's always been baked in there, and it's never really gone away. Where just every like, so because of that, interest rates are just a little bit higher than they would have been. And so it'll be interesting to see if we strike an agreement here, if that sort of thing happens, if we have that permanent, like, few point, you know, a few basis points of increase that just won't go away because of the, you know, the yeah. shaken faith or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Isn't it crazy, too, that our government can't seem to get themselves enough? Everyone agrees it's a bad deal. Everybody agrees we need to pay our debt and there could be a negative impact to the economy. And automotive is a leading economic indicator of health in the U.S. could suffer a consequence in interest rates and inflation and just lack of sure. consumer confidence. So it's interesting when you, know, you know, when you think about that. So what do you think? Uh, actually, let me go into one issue and then I'm going to ask you what you think the three hottest issues in automotive. Are. So as we talk about automotive being a great American industry, so what would you say the top three hottest issues in automotive are today, right now? I've got to go from the finance perspective, obviously. Yes, I mean, of I'm, course. Yeah. I, I can't speak to whatever the supplier relations or something on the OEM side, but obviously the interest rates are going to be, is an issue dealing with that. People will point out that where they're at now is really it's kind of where they were before the recession uh, yes. you know, or, or pre COVID or what, you know, yes. so we, we've just been kind of lucky to have very low ones. So now everybody's kind of having sticker shock, but you know, whether or not that persists, but it's still an issue. I mean, it's, it's going to be, 
it it does seem to be surprising consumers. Um, it's obviously a challenge that dealerships are going to, you know, uh, finance offices are going to have to face. I think one to watch just going forward will be, I, I don't know if it's, a, a, you know, like a major issue, but I, the one I think I'm, I'm kind of fascinating to watch is what kind of what F&I looks like as, you know, more of the process moves online. Um, yeah. Customers, yeah. I mean, I think you and I have talked about this. Customers still... There's a lot of indications that customers want to still come into the dealership at least for the test drive. I mean, which yeah. you know makes a lot of sense. And you know, and they. But the question is, how much of it are they going to want to do in advance online? And financing seems to be a part where they'd like to get more of that done, or at least a significant amount. Uh, um, you know, I, we we recently did a thing on kind of virtual F and I, so to speak, and and you know the the idea that whether or not customers can you know self select products or whether it would make it, whether that part could be moved online or whether they would still want to talk to a person. Um, what, what was the it, outcome of that? What, what's your opinion? The, the, the thought process was that they, um, they would like to do a lot more of it in advance and have that work acknowledged in the store, but they still want to talk to, you know, uh, like a human specialist. Um, why do you think that is? I think it's just because it's, uh, well, for one thing, I guess it's why you have a chat or, you know, contact support on any website. I mean, you yeah. know, you, you yeah. okay, I, I can read this. What is this actually saying? You know, can I hop on a quick, you know, and, and, you know, it's, 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 but um, yeah. So I think, I, I, th I think that's part of it. Just a natural, like, this is kind of unfamiliar territory. So it's nice to talk to somebody who knows, you know, yeah. who's an expert in it. So do you think it's the complexity of, of the products that are offered and the options around this big purchase or, and, or is it mm -hmm. just the largeness of the dollar value of the purchase? Right. Um, you know, it's a good question. And I, I'd have to, I'd have to go back to the article and see how much of it was on the, the, fi you know, related to the finance versus related to the, the products themselves. I would, yeah. I would suspect there would be interest in both, you know, just because, the, you know, working with the different, you know, permutations and things like that of how you might want to structure a deal. Um, yeah. Is, is anyone, yeah, is anyone kind of leading the way in that kind of virtual F and I from a vendor or a group that's publicly known standpoint? Well, I, would, I would say there's a couple of different ways to look at it. One is that um, a couple of the large dealer groups, you know, um, Asbury, and I want to say group one or are posting very good results, not having anyone on there. So it's interesting to watch that. This is yeah. what the F and I gross is. Asbury still the humans are winning. Like if you, yeah. you know, yeah. having a real person, they they're <laughs> overall. But I want to say it's Group One is it was actually better. You're seeing it better on just completely self selected buying online. The the flip side is um, we talked to um, ITAP Menu was one that I talked to for the article. Um, they had talked about the self selection on F and I doesn't seem to be working. Like it can it, it, I think they kind of use the same thing you did. It's too big. I you know I don't understand. I don't know what these things are like. Yeah. And so they they scrap or they're they're I think scrapping that. And it's only going to be you know it's there with the option for a person to to talk to. Um, so yeah. they were one. I think Cox was is another one that that's kind of playing around in that space. I'm sure there's other vendors as well. JM and A was using it more for an efficiency sake in the actual dealerships, which was interesting. It was like, you know, you've got this F and I guy stacked up with like five, you know, a million customers waiting. Well, let's, you know, let's have them Skype in or whatever you want to say to somebody remote just to kind of, you know, not make these poor customers wait forever. And so that was another interesting application, but it's more, that's more on the, you know, process, you know, internal in, in the actual dealership side than on the, virtual yeah. shopping online side of. But I think even they would say that was a challenging uh, test. It didn't go as well. I mean, it's a challenge on something, on a purchase this big. I think part of the challenge is people come in to buy a car they can touch, see, feel, get excited about. It's a tangible yeah. thing, right? And then, and then you transition into this process where you're looking to purchase an intangible product, a protection. Right. And it's, it's a, a large high dollar product by and large, service contracts are expensive because cars break down. And so how do you quickly understand that and then kind of change your mindset to say, hey, I see the need. CSI actually would show that a customer that purchases some of that service contract mm -hmm. and others, 
the CSI, the, the satisfaction with the ownership goes way up. So it's an interesting conundrum that technology just hasn't quite figured out yet. I'm going to be excited to stay tuned with you as, as you kind of navigate through this to see what, what, what is the, what is the solution? Somebody's got to come up with a solution. Don't you think, John? Yeah, and it, it's gonna be it is gonna be like it's gonna be kind of one of those where you have to kind of offer multiple options, I think, because yeah. you've got there's there seems to be a growing amount of people that want to do a large chunk of it online, but there's gonna be a certain amount of people where they just wanna do everything in the dealership. So I don't think it's I don't think you're gonna, you know, be able to fire all your all your staff or something and just have like a server farm, you know, like yeah. or something. By the like way, that. to our employees, that is absolutely not the case. We believe yeah, okay, in, yeah, yeah, in, good. we believe <laughs> We believe in that human experience. We believe right. as we're seeking to deliver that ultimate automotive experience, it's human to human. And yet it's so interesting, John, since I got into the auto business in the late or early 90s, there's always been kind of this looming threat that technology would remove people from the experience. And in fact, it really seems what technology has done has enabled us to better, more fully connect with the customer. And to that extent, it's done a great job. But it just hasn't figured out how to completely remove that human element. There's something about automotive being such a large purchase. You know, a house is a big purchase. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of ways, even the home buying experience has become more digitized than automotive is. There's something about these cars we drive around that there's still a human element. And maybe that'll shift. Do you think that shifts at some point? Or uh, do, do you think... Uh, technology just will find a better way to enable us to connect. You're right. The size of the purchase is, yeah. is a big factor. And you mentioned home buying and that, that's an interesting one. Like it's been a few years since we bought the place, but I wouldn't have wanted to do that without a realtor. But partly yeah. in that case, you <laughs> you guys would appreciate this. You're only buying used. And, you yes. know, and, and so yeah. having yeah. A, a realtor was able to a like narrow down what was out there to kind of fit what we were looking for and, and B, just their expertise in like, okay, you see that up there, that's a problem. Like, I wouldn't, you know, like, that's an issue with this house. Don't do that. Or, you know, this, yeah, yeah this is okay. Don't worry about that. Um, yeah. So that, that was helpful. And I would, I would imagine there's a certain amount of that with a car. What I think will be interesting though, is if you have your repeat customer who like always buys a Ford F-150, you know, it, it, he or she, it's Ford, you know, Ford, they, or they buy it or even more, they lease it. Like, are they really going to want to deal with you yeah. when you just be like, click renew or, you know, release that or something like, you know, if you're, if you're just kind of one of those, you have your brand or you have your model that you always do like that, I think you could totally do online yeah. at a certain point. You know what you're buying. Like you're not going to yeah. change like the, yeah. like the Tesla diehards. They're not going to, I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. It'll be fascinating, John, because I can't tell you how many meeting requests I get every single week from a company that says, hey, we have the process. We've got the yeah. DR tool and we can take you from start to finish. And I don't think the, the technology is there. And actually, yeah. Oh, yeah. To, to everybody listening to this, don't call me saying, hey, I've got the technology. But it I, I don't know that it's it's good enough yet where it 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 is compelling to the consumer and it creates this ick creates the ultimate automotive experience. So it's going to be fun to watch this. So so Go transitioning ahead. a little bit, transitioning yeah. a little bit. The other thing that's happening in the next 30 days is the new FTC safeguards rules coming into full effect, oh, yeah. right? So this is the one that was uh, uh, purported to go into effect in December of last year. The, uh, uh, those that are in charge uh, came back and said, hey, you know, what? we're going to delay it six months. And I think one or many elements of it and it was said, hey, the biggest reason for this is a lot of the technological technology components required to put this into place, just uh, there were shortages and, and there just wasn't an ability to do it that quickly. Uh, the right. June deadline is, is quickly looming. What's your sense of how prepared most dealers are out there to meet all the requirements of this? You know, that's a great question. And honestly, it's hard to say. I mean, I still, you still hear the, you know, because we, <laughs> quite frankly, we, we covered a lot on how to do it, like yeah. how, how yeah. to prepare, yeah. like all through December. And then it was yeah. kind of like, okay, well, it's, it's been delayed, which is, you know, it's good. I mean, the, the other thing they mentioned that like, nobody can find the staff necessarily. Like that was the other thing. Like, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, the, the skilled technological, cause you can outsource, you know, you can the the job you need to have to be you know your security guru yeah. or something you can outsource it especially if, you know like if you're a, you know mom and pop dealership one store you yeah. probably don't have like you know 
some Bill Gates <laughs> IT right. in-house guy like that. On, yeah. and so anyway. That's the benefit of a large auto group such right, as right. us. Where you guys, you can you've just got multiple me. points. You know, we've right. got a head of security that used to be a police chief in a large area. But not a lot of groups have that, right? Or the right. technological expertise. Yeah. So. But yeah, in terms of, but it's funny, in terms of the preparation, no, it's something we need to really, we probably should drill in on before the actual de deadline. Um, yeah. Because we've been, we've been so focused on telling dealers how to do it. I don't know if we've really looked into how, you know, yeah. how up they are. We, yeah. I think, uh, you know, with the, with the extension, hopefully that woke a lot of people up where, where yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, that, okay. Well, and there've been some good technology and there've been some good provider partners in that. Comply Auto is one oh, example. Yeah. We've we've partnered with them. And, you know, it, it shocked me because last year, as we looked at the requirements, it seemed pretty straightforward and easy. And then as you started to put a lot of the components in, certifying the other vendors you do business with being one of the biggest, um, yeah. you know, it, it ended up being a, a big lift uh, to certify each of those vendors, require them to meet the requirements ask them to sign off that they've met the requirements and then just to have it work. So um, it'll, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what your perspective is on if dealers say, Hey, we're ready or we're struggling. Right. I would. Uh, yeah. And I think the vet it's, from what I've heard from, uh, you know, at least one compliance expert that like, you know, it, it was kind of like, okay, breathe like this, yeah. the stuff yeah. that, they, that they're asking you to do, it's not as, you know, it's not as crazy as, as you think it is, or that some vendors might make it out to be, you know, yes. but everybody yes, wants we, to charge you to become compliant. And at the end of the day, a lot of the stuff you're probably yeah. already doing anyway, because they're good practices, right. right, John? But the vendor thing, yeah, I, I don't envy dealerships on that one, because that's, you can't control that. I mean, you can, yeah. you can control internally. I mean, outside of, I guess, just not doing business with somebody, but that's, if you haven't found or lined up a replacement, you know, <laughs> yeah. I would imagine that's the toughest part. I mean, you know, I don't have any data to support that, but from that's the, the sticking point we kept hearing as a, you know, as a concern. So turning to the economy, and then I'm going to ask yeah. you what's on your bucket list. And I'll tell you in a minute why. Um, okay. Turning to the economy, you know, we're in an interesting time where, you know, last year and the last couple of years through COVID created some opportunities for auto dealers nationwide. We're kind of coming into a time where, New inventories are slowly increasing. Used is psychotic. Nobody understands our values up or down or where are they? Yeah. Yeah. What what what's your take on the state of the economy right now? And is this some sort of a new norm? What what's your take? The um we just um me and my colleague Gail Howe, the other reporter, we just got yeah. out of the Auto uh, Finance East Summit, and that was a big um. There's a they they always have a great panel of the um some you know, residual value used car experts. And, and that was, uh, the, the thought was that used car, like don't expect the used car prices to fall off a cliff. You just have this, you have too little inventory, you know, of this yeah. gap yeah. coming in where to kind of refeed the market. And you have a lot of commercial vendors. Um, you know, you also have a lot of commercial vendors, fleets, things like that, that, that need vehicles. So yeah. it's probably, you know, you're, if you're an OEM, you can just serve that business. You don't need to like, you know, start cutting prices or, you know, doing incentives yeah. like crazy, which I know isn't great for you dealers who have to deal with the regular customers, you know, who, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but there, there was, um, but anyway, but, you know, and to that point, actually, there was signs that um, like some of the OEMs, at least Honda, I think was one that was mentioned that are starting to okay, we made all the high-end models during the recession because we we got to make something and this is the best you know profit margin. Let's, okay, Honda start like, okay, let's start making base models again because now with yeah. the economy and all that, consumers are starting to look out for that. So I think you could see some of that. But anyway, yeah, the use, use prices, it didn't seem, there doesn't seem to be a sense that they're going to just fall off a cliff. Like yeah. it's just the, the, just the other conditions still have to work their way through the system, you know? Well, not to mention uh, the lack of leases that are going to be coming yeah. up here over the next year or two. P uh, during the new car shortage, there were not a lot of factory incentivized leasing going on. And that's going to create a one, two or three year glut as the SAR right. starts to catch up with the market. And that's going to impact used cars. So it is interesting. You know, we saw a little bit of a decrease in used car prices first quarter of this year. And then it, that quickly <laughs> that quickly reversed. And not across the board. It it reversed in some segments. Um, it was odd, actually, and 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 I think it's tough for 
you know, I feel bad for some of the used car managers trying to figure out how on earth to yeah. attack this and still deliver the best product to the end user, to the customer, which again, yeah. John, probably makes a great argument for this auto uh, model we have where you've got experts that are trying to figure out some of these trends and deliver their best for the customer. Yeah. And I always, I, it always strikes me um, for all the research customers do, there's still a large amount of them that are willing to be, um, that are willing to be swayed, which, you know, like, yeah. okay, they, or they, they're not locked into a specific car, despite all that, like they're willing to have something else suggested to them. So yeah, I think there's a real value in that. And from a finance ring perspective, that comes back to a trend we're also watching where get the financing first, like figure out what the, what you can afford, what your actual credit is. And I mean, you can do it with a soft pull first, but you know, yeah. get that out of the way rather than just, oh, you pick out your dream car. And then at the end, you find out like nothing, there's no way to finance this thing. Or <laughs> yeah. not, you know, yeah. like come in yeah. with what you can actually, what your legit budget is. And then, you know, go yeah. from your used car. That's interesting. So are you starting to see a trend where people are doing that more now? Or are yeah, you seeing uh, vendors, technology vendors and others trying to uh, push that? I think it's both. And I think it's just, I think it's just common sense, to be honest. I mean, it's like, you know, you're not going to start looking for a house until you have a, you have the credit yeah. offer in hand. Or I always joke about this one. My wife's a fan of the say yes to the dress show. And I mean, the, the wedding where they shop for <laughs> wedding dresses, yes. the first thing they always ask them, what's your budget? Cause they don't want to show them stuff that they can't yeah. afford. And it's yeah. like, I think that's kind of, the, that makes a lot more sense. And yeah, vendors yeah. are kind of doing that. The soft credit pulls help because you can really, start honing in on that. And I think that's just kind of a, you know, a smarter way to play things. I mean, you can still yeah. bake your margin for arranging the loan in there as a dealership. Yeah. But yeah, just get it, you know, I don't know. To me, that just seems like a more logical way to do things. But I mean, I'm, yeah. you know. <laughs> so it's interesting what you describe is a lot of auto sales 101. Those should be the first steps in any professional, you know, as they're walking through the process. It is interesting though. Some it's vendors, end, you know, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. some, some vendors have said, Hey, you know, you need to, give customers a very forceful first look at that approval process on your website. Hey, kind of force them yeah. to go through the pre-approval. And I'm not sure that's a good idea either. If the customer wants that, do it. If they right. don't want that, kind of let them go through that exploration and then back into it. And, you know, I think one of the great things about the automotive yeah. industry, again, that makes it the great American industry is there can be multiple paths to kind of that that end completion. So it'll be interesting to see what you find out on that as you go. I think, yeah, I, no, I think you're dead right, Sam. It's just, you know, meet the customer how they want to be you yes. know, met, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Inside our auto group and familiar to many of our podcast listeners on the Driving Vision podcast, we had a, a social media figure, Ben Nempton. So uh, mm -hmm. he he has a show or had a show on MTV. And uh, he had, he made an entire show out of what is on your bucket list. So he and a bunch of his friends while they were in college created this long bucket list, I think a hundred plus items. And then they sought to go across the country uh, checking off those bucket list items. So they played, they played basketball with the president. They had a beer with Prince Harry. <laughs> they uh, they did oh they sing the national anthem at an NBA basketball game though they don't <laughs> sing uh, they don't sing they did all these crazy things and in the pursuit of these bucket list items they actually gave back in some pretty meaningful ways but we're fascinated by what is on people's bucket list so I'm going <laughs> to ask you John Hutter automotive news reporter what's a bucket list item for you that you would love to accomplish at some point in life we'll make it that broad. Publish a book. Self-publish is oh, fine. Amazon yeah. Kindle is a great, you know, great service to do that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, write write a book and publish it. And then the other one would be visit all um, all the continents. My brother-in-law oh, suggested cool. that. And it, it, Chris, I was like, well, yeah, I want to go to all those places, and I definitely want to go to Antarctica at some point. So yeah, yeah. that's that's a good way to word it. So yeah, because I I love travel. My wife and I love love travel. So how many continents have you hit so far then in your pursuit? Yeah, we're not. We're uh, let's see. Uh, just three or well, yeah, I guess three. Cause you're, if, if you're counting uh, Mexico as part of North America, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. North America, Europe and Australia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I gotta get, yeah, we gotta get to the other ones. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. We're going to follow you on that. I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask go. you a follow up and then what, what's your book going to be on John? You know, I, uh, just, a, I would I'm probably fiction, honestly, I'm a, I'm a reporter, but you know, it's always like, I never, I always kind of thought that, you know, the 
writing <laughs> writing where somebody pays you for it made a lot more sense than being a starving fiction writer. Yes. But it's yes. like, well, yes. yeah, so I've got some ideas. <laughs> well, we wish you luck in your pursuit of that, John. Yeah. We appreciate you uh, spending time with us today on the Driving Vision podcast. Your perspective as part of this Meet the Automotive Pre- Press segment are fascinating. And uh, we hope you'll be back soon and we can continue the conversation. So, John Hutter, Automotive News, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) A special thanks to John Hutter with Automotive News for contributing to this week's episode of the Driving Vision Podcast. Until next week, how are you driving vision today? (laughs) 